Chad Easty Show News Talk, 95.1 FM, 790 AM, KFYM. We go to the phones. And uh, joining us uh, right now, Republican strategist Matt McCoviak. Matt, good morning. How are you today? I'm doing great, Chad. Good morning. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of big news day uh, in Texas and nationally as well. Let's start off uh, with a, a story that I know you included in your uh, morning email that you sent out, and also you uh, sent it out on Twitter, the story from Politico about Senator Cornyn and the uh, headline, Cornyn Braces for Brutal Texas Re-Election Battle. Uh, we, we we both know, and, and I, when I had uh, Cornyn on my show last week, he talked about uh, you know, Texas, uh, you know, staying red in 2020 and that uh, a lot of folks have, have uh, just kind of set back. A lot of Republicans have just kind of set back and uh, he fears that uh, the president could lose Texas in 2020 if Republicans don't get out in front of this. Uh, what do you make of this article from Politico? Uh, you know, without even knowing who he's going to face as a challenger, uh, does he really face that tough of a reelect in 2020? I think they're they're being smart and preparing for a worst case scenario. Uh, you have to remember, Cornyn is now in cycle, uh, but he watched the Cruz cycle pretty closely. Saw Cruz win by two point six percent. Saw Beto raise well over seventy, perhaps eighty million dollars. It was unprecedented um, level of uh, financial investment on the Democratic side. Now, I don't believe the Democrats will have uh, that kind of transcendent candidate in twenty twenty for U.S. Senate. I don't think Beto will run for Senate. Uh, even if one of the Castros were to run, I don't think they'd be that strong, and I don't think they're likely to run either. They don't have really anybody else that would be even close to being a first-tier candidate. So so fundamentally, I don't think Cornyn is in that much danger. That said, they're preparing for the worst. He's building uh, you know, a first-rate team, hiring John Jackson, uh, Abbott's campaign manager, to run his campaign, uh, hiring Steve Munisteri, the former state party chair, to be a senior advisor. Those are two of our best operatives in Texas. So, look, Corn has taken it very seriously, and obviously the, uh, the majority in the Senate you know, could be on the line in that kind of circumstance. You could imagine if they were to lose the Texas Senate seat and then they lost you know, Maine and Colorado or Colorado and Iowa, the Democrats could take the Senate back and the repercussions would be disastrous. So, um, you know, they're, they're taking it seriously, but until we know who the Democrats are running, uh, both for Senate and who's going to be on the ticket at the, at the top of the ticket on the presidential level, uh, we're not going to be able to say with much confidence whether that race is ultimately truly competitive or not. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think that, you know, for Cornyn, I think that they looked at the Cruz race, and, and one of the criticisms that I had of the Cruz race, and I think others did as well, is that they they started things too late. Uh, yep. And, and it, they almost didn't take Beto O'Rourke seriously until it was almost too late. Uh, yeah. Who knows if there is another Beto? I, I, I don't know if at you know this point in the Cruz race we were that worried about Beto O'Rourke. Who knows? There might be another Democrat out there. I think it's smart uh, for Cornyn and company to get started right now uh, just to kind of fend off anyone. And they can raise money, which is big. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. You know, and Cruz had a national donor base. You know, in a grassroots donor base, having run for president, having been, in a, you know, catching lightning in a bottle when we went for Senate six years before, uh, Cornyn will have uh, certainly ability to raise money, but I don't know that he has necessarily the same type of national fundraising base that, Cor- that Cruz had. So if he, if he needs to go out and raise 30 or $40 million, which I think is what his campaign is probably thinking, um, then they know they have to start now. Now, he does have the advantage of obviously representing a large, successful you know, state. He has the advantage of having just served as whip, the number two Republican in the Senate leadership. He has a lot of relationships, a lot of people that want to help him. So he's going to be in a strong position. Uh, and I imagine his numbers in Texas, I believe his numbers in Texas are, are pretty strong, which is, you know, you add all that together, that's all part of the reason why I don't think he's going to face uh, a serious candidate. But you're right to point out that we didn't probably think two years ago that Beto would be the national figure that he became. I do think you, he had some some candidate skills that were unique. Um, you know, uh, there's not another member of the congressional delegation in Texas, I think, that could probably do anything, even half of what Beto did. So I just think, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see what, who's going to be on the ballot for president on the Democratic side and then who's going to run for Senate. We'll know more, a lot more probably by third or fourth quarter of this year about how that's all shaping up. Speaking of Beto O'Rourke, uh, yesterday he was praising Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Today, He's going to be sitting down with Oprah Winfrey. Still, nobody knows where this guy is at as far as a 2020 presidential campaign. Uh, there's been some bad news. Uh, it's not been a good news cycle for Beto O'Rourke. Uh, what are his, compared to right after the Texas Senate race, what are his presidential chances at right now, you think? 
Yeah, I think his position has weakened considerably in the last two months. You know, um, really, almost every news story that, that we've seen about Beto since the election has been has been negative. Um, you know, Democrats are asking, you know, what is he doing? Um, why is he not out there? Why is he not, you know, meeting with people and, and talking about running and starting to at least put the pieces in place in case he wants to do it? Um, you know, he had this disastrous interview with the Washington Post where he had almost no substance whatsoever, including on, on border security issues, which you would presume he knows something about, having represented El Paso in Congress for three terms. So, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what he's doing. I, I mean, my guess is that he is trying to reconcile whether he truly not only wants to run for president, which is obviously a two-year intense commitment, uh, he's probably also trying to reconcile whether, you know, he really feels he's up to being president. Um, you know, if you're in the Senate or you're a governor, uh, you probably do think you can be president. If you're in the Congress, it's a little bit less uh, clear that, that, that you can certainly feel that way. If you're in leadership, perhaps you feel that way. But, but it's an awesome responsibility, former Mississippi Governor Haley Barber uh, said about running for president, because he got really close to running in 2008. Uh, and that is, you know, running for president is not about a two-year commitment. It's about a 10-year commitment, because you have to be prepared to serve two terms, and you have the two years running on the front end. So... You know, it's just it's radically going to you know change your entire life. And part of what we've seen, Chad, over the last two months is is that the national media is now vetting Beto. Uh, they didn't do it for two years when he was running for U.S. Senate because they didn't like Ted Cruz and they they ignored their responsibility to do that. Um, but they're doing it now, and they're doing it now because he's a threat. He's a threat to Bernie Sanders. He's a threat to Elizabeth Warren. He's a threat to almost every first tier Democrat because he can almost surely raise sufficient resources. He'd be a fresh face. He obviously has some real candidate skills. Um, so I, I generally would probably put him in the second tier, probably not the first tier uh, of candidates. Uh, but I think he's really lost momentum over the last two months, and I don't know whether you ever whether you can ever get that back. Yeah, and is there a strategy where you look at the the candidates who are announcing? You look at Kamala Harris, who I think everyone agrees is a a top tier candidate. She's been whacked. I mean, she she has gotten bad press uh, since that CNN town hall and was really yeah. flippant about uh, health care. And it just seems like every anyone who's jumping into this thing, Elizabeth Warren will officially announce. It seems like anyone who's officially jumping in, they're getting slapped around uh, by other Democrats, by some in the media. Is is there a strategy of going, okay, I'm going to wait until, you know, Biden jumps in, until Bernie jumps in, until, you know, the the new, uh, another crop jumps into this thing and kind of hang back and wait and see how this plays out? Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's probably more that he's just trying to work through the factors. You know, family, does he really want to do it? Is he up to it? Is there a path? Is he going to be able to raise the money? You know, looking at the early states, I think it's probably more that than it is not wanting to get whacked. I mean, he's been getting whacked for the last couple months, sure. and he hasn't really had a campaign to kind of help manage that, manage the response, manage, you know, the, the surrogates and the allies out there to, to help you. So um, I do think there's a cost here, though, right? I mean, Beto was kind of the hot thing in politics two months ago. He's really not anymore. I mean, in some ways, Kamala Harris is, has maybe taken on on that, that mantle on the Democratic side, at least uh, for now. So, and keep in mind, I mean, every day people, you know, it's, I know it's incredibly early, but every day people in the early states and major donors are starting to make decisions. And Beto hasn't really been in that conversation. Uh, as you see more and more and more Democrats go ahead and formally announce, well, Elizabeth Warren will be announcing, you know, this weekend. You just said Cory Booker. So you have, you have several senators, you have some governors, you have some, probably some CEO types, uh, some House members. I mean, there are going to be a lot of choices on the Democratic side. And right now, Beto, I think Beto maybe thought he had more time than he probably ended up really having. Hmm. Um, but, you know, who wants to run for Senate for two years, wake up the next morning, and then run for president after you lose? Yeah. Uh, that's just not, that's really not probably a realistic expectation. But these races, these presidential races are beginning earlier and earlier and earlier. I think the drop dead chat, honestly, is June. And, and really, it's probably May because you need, you want to be in that first uh, series of televised debates, which begin in June. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the State of the Union address because that's going to be the, the, the big one today. You have the State of the State uh, here in Texas, but, uh, you know, nationally, you have the State of the Union address tonight. What what are we hearing uh, about the tone and the direction the president wants to go in tonight for the State of the Union address? Yeah, my, my sense is this is going to be more of the same. Um, if you look at the guests he's bringing, uh, you can see which issues he wants to focus on. He's going to focus on opioids, human trafficking, certainly um, you know border security, the economy. Um, so I think the themes will be the same. The question is whether 
the, the approach is any different, if the tone is any different. You know, is he really going to reach out to Democrats tonight? Is he going to talk about how they can work together to pass infrastructure, to, you know, pass the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade deal, um, to, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, reform or, or, or reduce uh, drug prices? You know, areas where there really is some bipartisan agreement. Um, I, my, my guess is he's going to spend, you know, a lot of time on border security trying to sort of uh, move the public and win the arguments but ahead of the February 15th deadline. Uh, so, so we'll see. I mean, he's obviously going to be giving uh, that speech in front of a very different audience in the room than he has in the first two. Uh, he, you know, given that it'll be a divided co- Congress, given that he'll have Speaker Nancy Pelosi over his shoulder, um, and he's going to have, you know, more than half of that half of those folks seated are not going to be uh, standing and, and giving him much applause very often. Of course, you have, you know, a good number of those people who are going to be running to replace him, running to try to succeed him, defeat him. So we'll see what the theme and the, and the tone looks like tonight. Um, you know, I, I actually like these moments for him because he gets a chance to deliver a message, but, he, but he's sort of forced to be disciplined. You can't riff on a State of the Union, and he hasn't in the two previous ones, and I don't think he will tonight. I think he'll be delivering the message that the team and he have all agreed on. And so I, I imagine he's going to get a bump out of this. It won't be maybe a major bump, but it should be you know a few points, five points perhaps, uh, and that'll be a welcome uh, development. Yeah, absolutely. Matt, tell folks how they can sign up for your newsletter and what your latest podcast episode is on. Yeah, I know you enjoy the newsletter, the Must Read Texas morning uh, email that we send out. Over 3,000 Texans receive it. We take all the news from around the state, put it in one easy-to-read email sent, sent by 9 a.m. each weekday. You can sign up for a free one-week trial at Must Read Texas. Dot com. Uh, the podcast is called Mac on Politics, uh, and it's uh, available really everywhere you can find a podcast on the, in the iTunes Store, on Spotify, uh, uh, on uh, Stitcher, on Google Play, and on the web at MacOnPoliticsPodcast.com. Uh, recently interviewed Steve Kornacki, the uh, national political correspondent for MSNBC, and I'm actually taping an interview with Cliff Sims the White House, uh, Trump White House aide who has written a tell-all book uh, today. So that should be posting later this afternoon. You can check that out. Very interesting. Matt, as always, appreciate your time. We'll visit with you next week. Take care. Have a good one. That's Matt McCoviak here on the Chad Eastie Show.